This week on the show, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is investigating a potential act of sabotage at the San Onofre Nuclear Power Plant in Southern California. We'll talk about that. Also, the Oyster Creek plant in New Jersey reported a crack in a reactor head during a routine check. We'll talk about why other plants with similar cracking might not be reporting their problems to the NRC. Finally, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission will back a study to reevaluate earthquake probability and risk. Joining us this week is Fairwinds Chief Nuclear Engineer Arnie Gunderson. All coming up next. All right, Arnie, thanks for coming on the show again this week. Thanks for having me, Kevin. I want to get right into some news coming out of San Onofre, the plant, the nuclear plant in California that remains shut down right now. Coolant was discovered in its diesel engines, uh, according to the NRC. Can you talk about that a little bit? What's going on? Yeah, on Friday, so just two days ago, um, the report surfaced in the uh, local press where, um, um, you know, oil and water don't mix and, and uh, they're not supposed to mix. Uh, diesels run on diesel fuel, not coolant, and um, apparently they discovered uh, just um, a couple days ago that there was something in the diesel fuel that didn't belong there. This, the, the coolant used to cool the diesel has uh, inadvertently gotten over into the, into, the, um, into the diesel. I really shouldn't use the term inadvertent because um, the jury's still out on whether or not this was a... Uh, uh, a nefarious act or whether or not it was a mistake. So this could be an act of sabotage. Is this like putting a, uh, a jug of water in my car gas and my car gas tank or what what effect could that have? You, you know, um, so let's use your car as an analogy. At one end is the gas tank, at the other end is the radiator. And they're, they're placed far apart so you don't put the water in the gas tank. And uh, somehow or other that uh, that happened. Um, Diesels in a nuclear plant are obviously even more tightly controlled than putting oil in the, uh, putting water in the gas in your car. There's many procedures and many checklists that have to be followed when you're filling the uh, the, the diesel fuel reservoirs. So for um, for uh, coolant to get into that oil, um, I can't understand how they were either really dumb and violated many procedures or it's um it, it's it's malicious so two totally separate systems that can't leak from one into the other they're not even related uh the, yeah the, these these tanks that they test it um are supposed to be pristine and at the other end of the system is the diesel and its coolant so there's no interconnection uh, that uh, uh, that could potentially cross-contaminate. So why would anyone suspect something malicious? I know the NRC says they're looking into sabotage. Like you said, the jury's still out, but why? Yeah, well, uh, let me just quote the paper. Um, this, is, uh, this is coming out of the Orange County Register, and um, th their public relations person, um, uh, Edison Public uh, Spokeswoman uh, Jennifer Manfrey said that among the possibilities being checked out, was um, uh, was sabotage. Why? I, I immediately jumped to that. Uh, um, th there's so many things that would have had to go wrong to get the water over to the oil uh, or the coolant over to the oil that, um, th to me, uh, it, it, I can't explain how a, a system could break down so much that, it, um, th that you could cross-connect uh, those two systems on a nuclear plant. Is this a safety concern. Water in the diesels, I know if there's water in my gas tank in the car, the thing just won't start or may not start. Is that true of these nuclear diesels? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Edison has said that if the diesels had started in this condition, uh, they would have shut down. It, it, they would not have worked. So an act of sabotage or malfeasance is easy in that sense. Well, it's, uh, it's plausible. It really is. You know, if you got to look at the the rest of the the situation out there in California, um, for years um, there have been um, whistleblower problems at the San Onofre plant. San Onofre leads the country and has for seven years now on on whistleblower complaints. So they have a disgruntled workforce uh, with a management structure that was unresponsive to employee concerns. That's been going on for years now. 
Um, now they're shut down for a year, and they just announced they're going to lay off 700 of their nuclear workers. So it, to me, it's uh, to, to not expect some sort of malfeasance when you've uh, alienated a third of your workforce is um, uh, would be surprising. Right. Now, you mentioned the San Onofre plant leads the nation in complaints coming from whistleblowers. Can you talk a little bit about that? There's been um, a management shakeup a couple of years ago because the, the NRC was getting so many employees that uh, that felt throttled, uh, that uh, management wasn't listening to them, that they were going directly to the NRC. A and I'll tell you, on uh, of all the sites that uh, that I work with, I get more information from uh, insiders of San Onofre than any plant in the country. So clearly their employees are, um, are dissatisfied. The problem just got worse, though, because management said, um, uh, we're going to fire 700 of you by year end uh, because our plant's not running. We can't afford to, um, uh, to operate it anymore with, with this huge workforce. So they had a, 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 an environment that wasn't conducive to telling the truth for a long time. And um, now they've compounded by, uh, by a massive layoff. Now, of course, San Onofre's problems, the list of problems that San Onofre has just goes on. They're steam generator, they're plugged steam generator tubes. Now, you said before that they've had more plugged steam generator tubes than all other nuclear plants in the country, not more than, say, Oyster Creek or another nuclear plant, but the combined total of all nuclear power plants in the country is exceeded by San Onofre. Yeah, um, Oyster Creek doesn't have tubes. It's a boiling water reactor, but, but, but I'll <laughs> forgive you for that. But the, um, the, the combined total of uh, tubes at San Onofre that are plugged is around 1,300 tubes, and they plugged them in a year. These, these steam generators were replaced, and these brand-new steam generators had 1,300 tubes plugged. Well, if you look at the other 70 nuclear plants that have plugged tubes, the total from all those 70 pressurized water reactors are um, is less than than the the the, the tubes that were, were were plugged at San Onofre, you know, and, and this the decisions to build these steam generators that the way they were, were made back in 2004 2005, right at the same time that they had all these whistleblower complaints, so here's management stifling internal comment, and at the same time designing this brand new steam generator that uh, goes where no man has gone before, to quote Star Trek. And um, uh, should we be surprised that the steam generators failed in, in a year? The units are shut down now for um, 10 and a half months. And um, likely Unit 3 will never start up. And uh, Edison is trying frantically to get Unit 2 started up. Um, matter of fact, there will be a hearing this week in out in California uh, where citizens are invited to attend to discuss Edison's plans for starting up Unit 2 even though it's got 500 tubes that are plugged and a bunch of others that are um, that are in jeopardy. So let's look at San Onofre in the big picture. For the last five, six, seven years they've had the uh, a management environment that's not conducive to telling the truth and they um, the NRC is absolutely aware that they have hundreds of whistleblower complaints about San Onofre, much more than any in the country. And they've got steam generators that have tubes that are uh, plugged much more than any in the country. And, oh, by the way, they sit right next to the Pacific Ocean near, um, near an earthquake fault. And now we've got contamination in the diesels that may be caused by sabotage. Why is the NRC holding this meeting to discuss restart plans? Uh, I think the deeper issues have never been resolved at San Onofre, and those deeper issues uh, t uh, touch on the integrity of management. You know, the, the, the steam generator decision, for instance, that was wired. Management decided to tell their employees, we're going to make it without ever telling the NRC about all the changes. It's called 5059. So the decision was made, and then the employees did the analysis, and they said, oh, look, we don't have to tell the NRC about all these decisions because it falls underneath this 5059 threshold. What is 5059? That's an NRC requirement that if you make too many changes to a power plant, you're required to get the plant relicensed. 
Well, Edison didn't want to get the plant relicensed. So the management decided, well, we're going to somehow or other make this thing fall below that threshold. And they told the employees that's what they wanted. And son of a gun, the employees developed an analysis that said it's below that threshold. These are the same employees at the same point in time that um, uh, that felt stymied by management and were complaining uh, with all these whistleblower complaints to the NRC. I don't think those two issues are unrelated. I think we had a management environment back when these generators were being designed that was not conducive to doing what NRC regulations required. Wow. So let's now take it to the East Coast. The NRC is reporting that Oyster Creek has a cracked reactor head. Now, my understanding is this is not related to Hurricane Sandy. Uh, can you talk about that? Yeah. the um, It's interesting. You and I might call them cracks, but... Uh, to um, uh, to the NRC, uh, what the NRC report says is that they are indications. Um, now, what that means is um, uh, when the unit was shut down for the normal refueling, um, they take the reactor and they um, um, they selectively apply almost like um, ink. Uh, it's called dye penetrant. And it, um, they, they apply it on the metal, and if there's a crack, the dye penetrant runs into the cracks. And um, uh, you can see it visually because it's so much darker than the rest of the surrounding metal. And so, this is just a procedural thing. This had nothing to do with Sandy. They right. were just this because was, they were refueling. Because they were refueling right. and the vessel was accessible, they did a dye penetrant test, and they, um, and they found cracks. Um, now, what will happen is, uh, first off, the refueling will be delayed. Um, and, and second off, they'll grind out the crack and they will re-weld over it um, to, um, uh, to prevent it from growing. How severe is, they, they call it an indication, but how severe of a crack is it? Well, the report doesn't say how deep it goes. And uh, uh, we probably won't hear for months about how deep the, the crack was. Um, Normally, these surface indications are not real deep, and the concern is not that they'll crack tomorrow, but that they'll grow mm -hmm. and and um, and cause the nuclear reactor to to um, to lose its its, its coolant uh, at a later date. So the the trick is here to catch these cracks before they become big holes, and um, apparently this time uh, Oyster Creek did it. So they're going to weld this thing up, and it'll be stronger than ever. It won't be stronger than ever, no. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting because these cracks, this, this vessel's 44 years old. You, you know, you would think you'd get, you, you'd get over getting acne when you finally reach adulthood here. And, uh, and yet the vessel is still developing cracks in the, uh, in the head. Now, I had a, um, an email from, uh, from someone down in, uh, uh, down in South Carolina, and he said... Um, we were talking about the cracks on, on, on Oyster Creek. And he said, here's the quote. He says, I found out there are cracks in the V.C. Summerhead. V.C. Summer's a, a, a plant in South Carolina. Um, and they're near the penetrations, near where the, the pipes go in and out of the nuclear reactor. But the NRC informed me this morning, this is yesterday, that the, uh, the cracks were not reportable because there wasn't any water leaking out of them. So, you know, this is an indication of a, uh, of a problem within the NRC as well. Here's Oyster Creek reporting cracks, and here's VC Summer not reporting cracks. Now, if we have regulations, they shouldn't be interpreted by, by Region 2 as the south and Region 1 as the north. So that was my question. These plants are in two different regions. Yeah. Two different jurisdictions or... Um, well, in theory, they have the same laws they have to abide by, but right. uh, it looks to me like uh, Region 1 interprets the regulations one way and Region 2 interprets the regulations another. So here's VC Summer with cracks in its head, and we don't ever read about it. Mm -hmm. And here's Oyster Creek with cracks in its head, and we wind up reading about it. So clearly within the um, uh, NRC's regulatory uh, structure, the two regions look to me like they have a double standard. Clearly, within the um, uh, NRC's regulatory uh, structure, the two regions look to me like they have a double standard. 
You know, in the last podcast, we talked about um, Sandy and the fact that the uh, fuel pool cooling system had, had shut down, and they had essentially a fresh nuclear core sitting in the fuel pool. Um, the NRC has announced that the pool would have boiled in less than a day. Um, but it's interesting. One of the things we're, we are not finding out is how long the fuel pool was not cooled and how hot the fuel pool got when it wasn't cooled. Um, you know, the, the, the NRC um, uh, doesn't feel obligated to tell the public uh, if they were at risk, and certainly the people that run Oyster Creek are not going to either. I would think that that would be information that should be shared with the public. You know, the pool didn't run for so many hours, and the temperature rose by by so much. But um, the NRC is playing uh, keep away with um, with that data. The, the Oyster Creek refueling outage before they knew Sandy was coming was supposed to last for 21 days. Um, we know that because. Um, uh, uh, a company that provides contract employees for outage work named Bartlett uh, announced it on the on the web. It says uh, um, the first day of the outage is um, October 22nd, and that the outage is supposed to last 21 days. Um, then you know, please be there on time, et cetera. So this was a note going out to employees that would be helping manage the outage. Yes, I see. Yes. I understand. Right. Um, what I think, though, is the the interesting end of the. Um, of the Bartlett uh, announcement, and they said, uh, um, yeah, "Come join Bartlett and the team at Oyster Creek for their 23rd refueling outage, and help make it one of the best outages of the season." <laughs> well, I think uh, this is not exactly the best outage of the season, and it's likely the worst outage of the season, with um, with the problems that Sandy uh, provoked, and now they've got cracks in their reactor. Do you get their Christmas cards too, or? No, <laughs> I'm not on their Christmas card list. I would like to talk about uh, NRC, and um, I understand the NRC is backing a new study to evaluate earthquake probability, basically to re-examine the risk, and this is being brought up. This is uh, an initiative, as I understand it, of the new NRC chairperson who is a geologist. Yeah, the, the Chairman Yasko was run out of office by the... Uh, by Congress, essentially, Congress is pro-nuclear, whether you're Republican or Democrat. Um, and in his place, um, the, the Obama administration appointed um, um, a, a, a woman named Allison McFarland, and uh, she's got a doctorate in uh, in geology. Um, she's against Yucca Mountain for geological reasons and has been. But in addition, you know, she obviously knows her stuff as somebody who. Had her entire academic career in in geology, and uh, she is um, uh, pushing the NRC to reevaluate seismic risks around the country. You know what? We built these plants 50 years ago as a nation. We we did the the site studies that chose these plants in the 60s, and. Um, uh, seismic risk and seismic analysis has grown dramatically since then. Um, and one of the things we've discovered is that we don't know much about East Coast earthquakes. Um, the, certainly we don't know about West Coast earthquakes, and there's a lot that we found. But, you know, if you ask an average American, they say um, earthquakes occur in California, and that's about it. But the um, the East Coast earthquakes are um, uh, are an area that really needs further analysis. You know, we talked about the the um, North Anna earthquake in the last audio, and we really don't need to talk about it again. But this entire issue of um, the the NRC being forced to go back and look at uh, whether or not we really need to redesign these or these plants to meet not the earthquake we thought would happen in 1960. But the earthquake we understand will happen now, uh, you know, 50 years later, with with better computers and better, better analysis. I don't expect any any seismic shift in these seismic calculations, not because the academics don't understand more, but because the industry can't afford to make any major changes. And so, still make money. And still make money, mm -hmm. right? These plants will shut down before they're modified extensively to meet these kinds of seismic risk. Well, finally, I just want to, before we leave, talk about a speak you're giving in New England coming up on Tuesday. 
Uh, yeah, I've been asked to um, to speak in um, Western Massachusetts. So if anyone in Western Massachusetts is uh, is interested, on uh, on November thirteenth, from uh, seven o'clock till nine o'clock in the uh, in the evening in Greenfield, Massachusetts. That's in the north um, the, the northwest corner of uh, Massachusetts. I'm going to be speaking at um, uh, at the uh, Unitarian Universalist Church there, and it's on Main Street in uh, in Greenfield. And th the topic is um, uh, you know more lessons from Fukushima, and uh, it's very near to the Vermont Yankee unit, uh, so there's some interest in you know. Uh, these units that are very similar to um, the Fukushima units, like Pilgrim in Massachusetts and like Vermont Yankee, which is about 20 miles away. So we'll be talking about the Mark I reactor design and um, um, uh, for about two hours. So I'm um, looking forward to it. All right. More lessons from Fukushima Tuesday 13th, the 13th in Greenfield, Massachusetts. Arnie, thanks so much for coming on.